we came under indirect fire, just hearing these booms. It was chaos. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The only thing I was scared of was failing, with letting down the people there that I was supposed to support. Things went south really bad. You've got to have an element of crazy to be good at what we do. There was an ego attached to being in Bangladesh. Being around big, tall trees, thick shrubbery, that was terrifying. Being around the potentially connecting to other moments in his life during battle. The story of transformation is powerful. Welcome to Life on the Line, Season 4. Our first interview of the year is with Sarah Watson. Sarah is a former intelligence officer in the Australian Army. She deployed to Iraq in 2006 and was the intelligence analyst for all Middle Eastern countries except Afghanistan during the Arab Spring. This is my conversation with Sarah about the challenges and the victories she faced in uniform and what she took away from her life in the military. I'm Alex Lloyd, speaking with Sarah Watson today in her home in Murrum Bateman. Sarah, welcome to Life on the Line. Good morning, Alex. Thanks for having me. Sarah, tell me a bit about your upbringing. I was born in Sydney. My parents met in northern Sydney and they lived in Belrose when I was a tiny tacker. And then my mum wanted to relocate to the country as she wanted horses. So dad obliged and we moved down to just outside of Yass when I was about three and rented a farm for a little while and then they built a house in Yass in town when my brother and I started school. So yeah, I attended the local Catholic school in Yass and my parents worked in town and it's a very 1980s country kid sort of upbringing. Yeah. There wasn't much else to do in Yass other than sport after school. So when I was about nine or 10, I got into the local Yass swimming club and swam every day after school and ended up sort of doing that for a few years and representing Yass at local swimming competitions around the Riverina and also got into gymnastics, dancing and little athletics and anything that was on offer in Yass that would take up the time after school and on weekends. But your life wasn't just about being after school. You also were quite diligent in school. I believe that you were school captain. Oh, right. I was as a year 12 school captain in Daramalan in ACT. Yeah, that was a bit of a shock to myself and probably all my friends because I was a bit of an introvert, a bit shy and, yeah, not the loudest in the crowd, if that makes sense. But I guess it did develop me in a way in that I became, uh, you know, I had to force myself to come out and be a bit more outspoken and, like, the leadership developed through that role. So, yeah, it was a really good challenge for me and it was a great privilege, I guess. There are some parallels there with your military service we'll get to a bit later. Tell me about any family military history you have. Well, um, both... You're opening your notes there, I (laughs) see. Yes, my grandmother and grandfather on my father's side both served during World War II. Grandfather was a joined the Royal Australian Naval Corps and was a lieutenant on submarine on active service in the Med. And my grandmother, she joined the Rands and served in Berry in the hospital there and also in Mitcham in South Australia. And she used to care for the injured servicemen as they came home. But my nan's favourite story she loves to share from that period of time was when she was flying home from South Australia to get married in 1945 and she was offloaded for a more senior and deserving officer who needed to get home for his wedding, which was my grandfather. So he got home for the wedding, but uh, yeah, she didn't make it. (laughs) But there you go, that was the way it was. They never really talked about it. I never remember them talking about their service as when I was a kid. So it's now coming out through sort of stories from my aunties and uncles about what they did. And yeah, it makes me quite proud. Was that pride a factor in you first considering to join the military? Or if not, where did that come from? Actually, it wasn't a big factor. My brother had enlisted a couple of years before as a private and went to Kapuka. My parents were quite happy about that. He got you know, offloaded 18. So my dad brought brochures home when I was in year 12 for ADFA and said, well, 
this is where I think you need to be going because mum and dad aren't going to be paying for your university if that's what you want to do. So ADFA, let's go. (laughs) Gets you out of the house as well. Yep. I managed to get through the selection and just after I turned 18, I joined the army. Did the concept have much appeal to you at all or it was just like the option put in front of you like, okay, I better get on with this, give it a go? wasn't my um, dream to be in the army. I had actually wanted to go down a sort of sporting or physio path. Dad's opinion meant everything, I guess, at that. And I thought, well, if Dad's saying this, maybe this is a good option for me. And I'm pretty determined. So whatever I decide to attempt, I try and see through. So it was. I got there. I found it tough in the initial stages, especially in the first six weeks of complete change of life, the institutionalization, I guess, of going from a civilian to a, an army person or military member. It was a huge shock to the system at quite a young age. However, the friendships formed in that first period of time was pretty incredible and becoming part of a fam- another family in a way was what made me want to stay. You talked about it being challenging. Was that a challenge you enjoyed stepping up to? I mean, like I imagine the fitness requirements and the study and just learning whole new skill sets, different lifestyle, way of living. Didn't get the domestic side of ironing and things like that until I got to ADFA. So (laughs) all that sort of really strict discipline, hospital corners on the bed, polished boots was, yeah, all new to me, I guess. And sheer discipline and trying to be, you know, working as a team to get things done was a great development and life skill to take on. Yeah, challenging in that in the 90s at ADFA was a tough time and it was a period of time where there was a a great deal of bullying. So in order to fly under that bullying radar as a woman, it was really important to be as strong and as tough and as fit as the guys, I guess. And that was my focus to be physically fit. So I didn't draw the crabs if that makes sense so yeah that was a big thing for me to sort of keep up with the men and that kind of helped me through in a way being fit the boys they respected us if we tried our guts out but obviously physical differences meant that we weren't as strong or as fast or whatever but I did take great pride in trying to do the similar standards that the men were required to achieve so I know I always achieved that that was my goal so yeah that that helped It is known there were some cultural problems at ADVA in the 90s and I can imagine lots of gossip rumours and just other interpersonal difficulties and such as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, It had to change and I'm glad it's doing that. Females, we copped a lot of extra attention, not, not necessarily positive. It was an extra challenge to get through, I think. In my personal experience, it's not the same for every woman. I was very naive being a country girl. I wasn't savvy to many ways of the world. So I guess in a way I had to grow up pretty quick and, yeah, work out the right way to deflect attention, I guess. You graduate ADFA with a Bachelor of Arts in Politics and History majors and then you go on to the Royal Military College Duntroon for 12 months. Yeah, that's right. I graduated and went with the rest of my class across the hill to Duntroon and we, yeah, we joined the, we called the Bakers, created our class that went on to do the following 12 months together of leadership and management and tactics. Becoming a, essentially a platoon commander is what we trained to be all to become by the end. So yeah, it was a pretty intense year after ADFO being a little more academic focus. This was both, you know, academic, physical leadership was the priority. So it was a big year. What were the attrition rates like? The attrition rate, I don't have the stats, but it was pretty high, particularly in the female cohort. I remember starting ADFA at about 45, 50 of us women, and I think we only graduated with less than half of that. It's a tough four years and tough 12 months at Duntroon for sure. We all have to step up and be our best. Old Mami motto, bring out your best. I guess it did that because there was no other option. There was no gliding through, if that makes sense. Yeah. And all those sporty interests you had when you were younger, do you think that helped give you a good baseline for that physical component? 
I definitely do think having so much activity as a youngster physically set myself up for a good, like my body to be resilient. I was carrying at least my body weight often out on field exercises. You know, I was only 50 kilos and when I was loaded up with the radio and the gun or the ammo and extra rations, it was tipping, you know, to that 100% carrying my own body weight um, for quite extended periods of time. So, yeah, I guess we'll see how the old hips and knees recover as I get older. I don't think they'll be um, immune to that sort of weight bearing as a youngster. As you progressed through Adva and Duntroon and are getting more used to uh, the military lifestyle, becoming your day-to-day, surrounded by those like-minded people and that routine, is that becoming more of an appealing thing to you? Going, yeah, I can see myself sticking this out, making a career of this. Yeah, look, I think, like I was saying, the friendship's formed in that training and you know the instructors that we had going through ADFA and RMC who were exceptionally motivating and inspiring I guess that drew a lot of us to want to be that way and pursue a career and do our best for our countries. When I was at Duntroon, you know, Timor had kicked off and it became real. We were transitioning from a peacetime army to an army that was sending forces overseas to react to situations like in Timor and it became a real thing and we wanted to contribute to that. That was a huge motivator. Where's your first posting after RMC? So I was allocated to Intelligence Corps. I had to do a two-year regimental posting elsewhere and I chose Signals. I had to do the Signals ROBC down in Melbourne for nearly six months with a one-year worth of an electrical engineering degree. And for those who know me well, I am not engineering-minded whatsoever or computer savvy. So that six months in down in Melbourne was quite challenging. However, it did give me the leadership skills to be able to go on and manage a troop in the Signals Regiment I was sent to. That posting was in Sydney in Holsworthy at 145 Signals Squadron and I was allocated to be the Information Systems Troop Commander, so in charge of the geeks, which again was a big challenge for me not having those computer science-y kind of skills. However, I was taught pretty quick and the guys that I was in charge with were wonderful in educating me and I just had the utmost respect for that troop who were very smart, all of them very smart operators and they were more than happy to help me understand their roles individually so that I could manage them the best I could and deliver the capability we had to deliver when we went on field exercises and, and things like that. So, yeah, that was quite rewarding as a first posting. It was, again, challenging as well with the different kind of things going on in in the world. When I was in that posting, I did my combat fitness leaders instructors course, just a two-week course to be able to run PT for the unit. So that became like a secondary role, which I absolutely loved and sort of then kind of concreted my passion for fitness and making the unit maintain the standards required of the army fitness tests and so forth. You talked earlier about being an introvert when you were in that school captain role. Now you're in an officer role, you're commanding 30-odd people, I'm assuming most of which are men as well. How did you find stepping up into that active leadership role, the interpersonal relationships you have to manage? Yeah, that's right. They were all men in my troop. That was unique, I guess, in that there weren't many females at all in the unit, certainly not in my troop. So I guess, yeah, I was kind of myself. I brought myself to the role. I tried to be approachable yet, you know, maintain that level of boss uh, officer relationship with the guys. They knew that I respected them. So I think that mutual respect came back. You know, there were occasions I was challenged, like I said, where I had to deal with a senior NCO who was a lot older than me and going through a marriage breakdown. And I had absolutely no idea how to sort of deal with those sorts of scenarios, having 21 years old and not in a serious relationship. You know, I I didn't understand the nuances of how to support someone through that. So yeah, there was a lot of growing in that role and learning and I hope that I managed to do what was required to get the best out of my team. Everyone has one, Sarah. What's your memory of 9-11? I was posted to this Signals Regiment, living in Cronulla and commuting out to Holsworthy. I was getting ready for work and this came on the TV and 
literally couldn't really understand if this was real or if it was a, a movie kind of scene. So I got to work and realised this was going down and it changed the world. It changed every aspect of the way in which in the military we were operating. Things came into place that hadn't existed before. Safe base ramped up to the highest level and we were under the pump with trying to get security measures in place to combat this new world environment we were about to face. You then moved from that troop and into the intelligence corps. And I know there are instances where you would be briefing not just a platoon, but hundreds of troops, you know, prior to going to their Timor and Solomon Island deployments. So that introvert side of you has really been parked as you're stepping up into this briefing role and you have to be on top of all this information. It's quite an important level of responsibility because they have to go in four arms with knowledge about what they're going into. The main job of our role as an intelligence officer is to brief the commanders who will be making decisions to keep our troops alive. So being able to articulate clearly what the enemy mission plan intent is going to be without mincing words to get it out as clearly as possible. So yeah, we did a lot of skills development on briefing commanders, analyzing the information at hand and coming up with the most likely courses of action that we would be faced against. So yeah, it was something that I had to push out of my comfort zone. And I do remember we had to brief continuously on our ROBC to practice those briefing skills, I guess. And I recall I must have been up to my 10th turn, I guess, in front of the class and the staff where I had to brief a, a scenario. And I started with, oh, goody gumdrops, you get to listen to me again, tongue in cheek. It's hard when you kind of find it uncomfortable standing in front of a group of people, trying to keep it interesting, trying to engage the audience trying to bring a bit of yourself to the brief as well because we're not robots, we are humans and it's our way of interacting that really maybe land information for people. So yeah, you don't want your audience tuning out when it's quite necessary they're paying attention to you. Exactly, yeah. And you also have to do some wargaming and other kind of stuff in this role as well? Yeah, tactically we had to play the red hat or the enemy role and wargame against the commanders. So as a lieutenant, I remember sitting against CO Fourfield up in Townsville and trying to convince him his plan had gaps in it and flaws because the enemy's tactics, according to the known information, could have turned his COA 3 into mustard, you know, so trying as a young officer again to convince a very experienced senior officer that there was things that maybe he needed to consider in his plan was very challenging as well. However, did it to my best ability. Hopefully there was that mutual respect of my training that they took in and took on board, but it was another development and growing kind of situation. The Army always encourages developing new skill sets, but you really take that to another level because my understanding of the Intelligence Corps is you're expected to, at that time, you're encouraged to learn a second language and you chose French. I did. And a lot of people go, how the heck did you get French? Uh, <laughs> which was a good question given our priority languages at the time were Arabic and Chinese, Indonesian and so forth. However, we do do a bit of engagement with the French forces. So I managed to build a reasonable case as to why French would be a good language to learn. And I got to Langs to do the long course in French, which was one of the best years of my career. I absolutely loved it. Studying six hours in a classroom a day and then four hours after class to consolidate what we'd learned during the day. I loved it. Like that really made me happy and I enjoyed the language training. Following on from that, being posted, sent on a mini exchange with the French army in um, Strasbourg at the end of the course where I participated in their infantry minor tactics exercise that was going on at the time. I briefed the senior field intelligence officer out in the field in French and, you know, and then we went and shot there for mass out in the bush and had a good chuckle because the French are amazing. They, they're super friendly and super welcoming and I felt like part of the team in just a few weeks and the way they do field as well is pretty cool from my perspective no ration packs really in sight apart from the guys who are going out for on sentry for a few days they have the full hot lunch provided with a dash of wine on the side this is why you chose french so you'd get sent here okay this makes <laughs> yeah, sense now yes yeah they know how to live they know how to do it 
It was a wonderful experience. And then following on from that, I did a few exercise quite a over in New Caledonia as a linguist supporting the, I think at the time, 3RER were doing rotations there for the exercise and practicing the various inter-army activities that we would do in securing the region. And much later, post-military, you lived in France for a couple of years. So obviously that all paid off for you long term as well. Yeah, it did help living in France recently. Having the language definitely was a bonus. Felt part of the la, la vie en France, I guess. <laughs> when do you first learn that you're going to Iraq, Sarah? I was posted to the Defence Signals Directorate in Canberra and the opportunity arose and I put my hand up. I said, yep, this is what I joined the army for. Please send me. It was the right place at the right time and I was going to be attached to the 2CAV 57 battle group to be their DSD LO, which is Defence Signals Directorate Liaison Officer, to provide the strategic intelligence feeds to that battle group whilst in country. And what year was this? That was 2006. So yeah, I did the lead up in Darwin, the force prep and everything with the unit up in Darwin for a few months of 2006. And then we deployed in November. Saddam Hussein was going through the trial and he was actually hung in December of 2006 when we arrived, which increased the activity, insurgents wanting to retaliate. And I don't want to underplay your role here because you are one of the only staff members there with access to the top secret information systems. So you're filtering through this to work out your briefings to patrol commanders and that kind of thing, what they need to know. You're tapping to all these different intelligence feeds, check them, corroborate them, dispatch a patrol to a point of origin of a particular person of interest or place of interest or site of interest or something like that. And it was a very time sensitive process. You get some information and you need to be the channel for our forces to act on that immediately. Yeah, that's right, Alex. I was the top secret conduit, I guess, for the tactical troops on the ground. So we were getting feeds from back in Australia and tapping into the resources of the States and the UK. And so, yes, that information needed to be desensitised to a point where it was able to be used. And in a matter of like a very short amount of time in some cases as well. So enormous amount of pressure to get that right. And I knew the fallout if I didn't get it right or didn't get it out on time was pretty massive. So I did feel the pressure. I had a wonderful offsider, Warren Officer Jones, who was my offsider. We worked really hard to get the raw intelligence and make sense of it for the patrol commanders going out to react or preempt activities that were going on in our area. Because life and death decisions are not just made on the ground by the patrol commander or the troops out there, it comes from the top, what information they know going into what they're sent for and why, all that. So your sway on the outcome of a mission or the well-being of our troops is vital. Yeah, I guess that's right. You can't sort of make up what's actually going on out there and from the enemy's perspective, capturing a vast amount of information and trying to figure out which bits are best to pass on in order to give the guys the best setup, I guess, to achieve their mission. There was a big amount of pressure sifting through the volumes and of raw data was quite a skill that had to be honed over there. I mean, you can only train so much, but yeah, that got more slick as I was there longer. Felt like I was doing a better job and sort of by the second half of the rotation and hopefully the guys felt comfortable knowing they were getting the best intelligence to execute their missions. We did rely heavily on our coalition partners in that respect. So I did do a lot of traveling around the AO, which led me down to Basra to facilitate the kind of information flow from the Brits who were based in Basra and also up to Baghdad at times to keep that relationship with the Americans to enable our flow of information to come through as well. Yeah, it's a very cool role you had and you are sort of the filter for all this kind of information, which not only makes your brain very interesting to know all the secrets that are going to be buried in there, you would have had to maintain the strictest OPSEC, operational security, while on the ground there at all times. There's no sort of casual gossip happening in the mess or that kind of thing. It's You're seeing a lot and you have to strictly control what goes in one ear does not come out the mouth. Guarding the information and treating it with the national security that we had to apply to it because if our coalition partners had found out we weren't treating the information in accordance with their policy, we would lose that access. So it was 
hard for the guys on the ground to understand. If you didn't hold that clearance, there was a reason why you weren't getting the raw data. It had to be managed in a way in which we were going to maintain our accesses in order to always have access to that raw intelligence and real-time data. And that was a heavy responsibility, I guess, on my shoulders that I didn't want to screw up because it could have meant that I ended up in jail or the guys who hadn't treated the information with respect ended up in jail. So there was that sort of added layer of complexity to my role. It's a seven-month deployment. Give me an outline of your typical day at life on base in Talil. Machine gun fire would start up at the range at about 4.35 in the morning. So that was kind of like Ravelli. Good morning. Yep, yep. <laughs> and then I'd get my gear on, wander over sort of pre-dawn to the SCIF, the Secure Intelligence Facility, and start my day about six o'clock before the guys started rolling in to the DFAC for their brekkies. I was going to need to have the brief out to the commander's early on to set their day up. So yeah, that was a busy morning period. Then maybe I'd get a chance to race up to the DFAT. But when I say race, it was about a kilometre walk, K and a half walk from the lines to, to work and then a K and a half or a K to get up to the DFAT. And we didn't have very many vehicles. So if we had the old Fitbit steps counter back then, I can imagine we were doing a lot of steps in a day just to get a meal or get to and from accommodation and things like that. So morning brief was the daily prayers, then back into interacting with HUMINT, the the human intelligence team to work out what support they needed for the day for their sources that they were meeting with. And then also sort of interacting with the EW team, ensuring that their processes are in, adhered to and sort of having regular meetings with all the intelligence operatives in the team, but also in the in the AO. So I was doing a lot of interaction with the intelligence guys that were there from the UK. Romania didn't have so much an active intelligence. We were providing them a lot of what they required on their patrols. Sadly, they did get quite a few hits and losses. And I'm wondering is that because they had a lack of intelligence support, they would go out on patrol and they had a lot of deaths actually whilst we were there, which was sad because you get to know the guys and yeah, that was quite awful. The day just flew doing probably sort of 16 to 18 hour days in the little skiff behind the barbed wire. So it did feel a bit like a mushroom at times, just sifting through information, coming up with the intelligence that was required to support the guys' patrols. Was it safe just to walk around the base or did you have to be armed at all times? What was the rules like? Differing times of heightened security. So we always carried a weapon. We weren't always aware when we were going to get rocketed. So there wasn't a real restriction on movement in terms of that because, you know, we might have had an indicator that there was going to be a rocket attack. So we might have known a period of time in which we were going to get rocketed so we could warn people to avoid movement, unnecessary movement. So that's what we kind of did. And sort of 50% of the time we were accurate. It was accurate. We weren't rocketed a whole lot, probably a few times a fortnight or so. There was worse rocket attacks than others as well, some really close, some that really shook to the core of us um, and fortunately no deaths. It did affect many of us differently. It affected me pretty badly because I felt like I was in a coffin more or less in this skiff. There was no kind of protection. So if it did land on us, we were screwed and that did play on my mind a lot. So... There's always that element of in the background, well, if it's not my day, it's not my day. And in terms of interactions with the locals, I understand you were employing some civilians on base, but was there ever paranoia? They could have been sympathetic towards the enemy? Oh, absolutely. And again, that was one of my tasks was to screen the locally employed civilians that we had coming in to our base. There was a lot of background work done on that to make sure we weren't putting ourselves in in the line of danger with these civilians because, yeah, I mean, they're all trying to make a living too and we can't always know their allegiances. There was nervousness towards some locally employed civilians for sure, especially I think myself and uh, my other intelligence colleagues because we kind of had that increased level of understanding and knowledge of that being an issue. There was a bit of tension with that, but we hopefully mitigated that by knowing as much as we could about those civilians that were supporting us. 
Speaking of your colleagues, I read in Paul Field's book, Gimme Shelter, in which there's a chapter on you, that something like only 2 to 3% of the personnel on base were women. I imagine that would have made you stand out. Yeah, look, that became even more of a problem. We had thousands of Americans on base with us, Minnesota National Guard. They weren't full-time military people. They'd been picked up, placed out in the middle of this desert to do the job that America had asked them to do. And they got extended while we were there from a, I think, 12-month to 18-month posting. And that was kind of mid my deployment. Things went south really bad. Morale went really south. People were so angry. It wasn't a choice. They were upset. Sorry, because that's the equivalent of like uprooting an Aussie Army Reserve group, planning them there for 12 months and then 18 months. That's sort of the American equivalent. Yeah, it's not their job. You know, it's not what their day job was, but they found themselves for 18 months in a war zone. and No wonder morale plummets. Exactly. So unfortunately, we started hearing of American soldiers raping other American soldiers, females in particular, and that added a whole nother level of stress, I guess, being one of the 2% of women out there. I did get hit on quite a lot by the Americans in the DFAC. They just, you know, very loud kind of overbearing personalities and they wouldn't think twice about coming up and, you know, accosting you in the mess and saying, how about it? I started going to the DFAC less. I started mess facility. I I didn't want to move around the base at all on my own. I was feeling really stressed because I was already probably heightened in operating as it was. So yeah, it got quite nasty. There was a few times, yeah, I got a lot of unwanted attention, a bit of a stalker at one point, which wasn't much fun because yeah, that's the last thing you need to be dealing with when you're trying to be in a war zone and keep your mentality together. I mean, yeah, you are in a war zone. You're not just in a war zone. You have a greater knowledge of the extent of what stuff's going on, that kind of risk level. It's a stressful environment. Your job is stressful and don't always have comfort in your own base because of rocket attacks or that kind of thing. And then you lose yet another layer of comfort and security. I can't imagine the just stress and mental toll that crews over time. Yeah, I think I started noticing physically, I guess, the stress increase because my hair started falling out and just little things like this. I lost a bit of weight. Sleep was going out the door. It was a complete shift in a lot of ways and it was so foreign to me because I'd wanted so badly to deploy for so long and it was not playing out how I had imagined it would to. However, you know, just kept going putting on my uniform every day and getting the job done. And that was kind of just maybe kind of, especially the last few months, it was in survival mode. I can recognise that now, yeah. Was it mostly Americans exhibiting inappropriate behaviour or Aussies as well? Sadly, a couple of Aussies did give me a hard time, didn't want to create a scene about it, so sort of managed it myself, which later on probably has created some issues within myself, but, you know... The last thing you want to do is cause increased volatility within your team by making a deal out of something. You did get to escape the base sometimes, although it wasn't exactly a holiday, because as we've talked about before, you'd often be briefing the patrols, but you would sometimes go beyond the wire or outside the base with them. How did you find that experience, being in Bushmasters, going through Iraq? Yeah, that was kind of exciting the first couple of times. But then as, again, the insurgents' activities increased, I got more and more anxious about doing that. There was one activity we did in Nasiriya whereby we, a local engagement with the authorities, the Iraqi police and security forces, and I was sat in a bushmaster in with the EW team to do a bit of work with them. And the mission blew out to about 12 hours and I couldn't exit this bushmaster. I couldn't get out because we weren't supposed to be there. So obviously it was uh, a long time. I remember not drinking water because I didn't want to have to pee. So by the time I got back from that very long day out, I had the worst migraine. I don't think I've ever had a migraine before that. But yeah, that that was kind of another additional physical uh, layer on top of the stressful kind of being out and about in a hostile environment. Did they have a mechanism to enable easy pain for female soldiers or you just have to find your own way? Well, they did issue us females with a she pee, basically a funnel. So 
<laughs> you still needed access to the outside or a bucket or something. Uh, however, I never used it. You took the camel approach instead. Yeah. I did. <laughs> you alluded to it earlier about Saddam Hussein. He was captured on December 13th, 2003, and on December 30th, 2006, while you were there, he was executed. What was it like being in the country when that occurred? Yeah, it was a very interesting time, of course. It was, you know, for their country, the supporters of Saddam, there was a lot of mourning and anger, and therefore we saw a spike in activity with insurgents ramping up their activities against the coalition. A tough time heavy period, I guess, of feeling the weight of the history that was being created as we were there. And how was it commemorating Anzac Day 2007 in that country? Two days before Anzac Day in 2007, our battle group was attacked and we lost a couple of Bushmasters. Fortunately, no one died. We had quite a few casualties. So Anzac Day, two days later, there was a lot of reflection a lot of acknowledgement of the risks that we were taking being there and going out to do the mission that we were being tasked to do. Anzac Day 2007 was the most memorable day, I think, for many who were there. I will certainly never forget that day. It really reinforced what being an Australian military member was. To be in the line of fire to protect what we love, our freedoms at home, that was really brought to the forefront that Anzac Day that what we were doing was real and it mattered. You also mentioned earlier visiting other places besides Talil and one of them was Basra. I understand your first entry to Basra was quite intense. Yeah, so I'd been asked to attend some training with the Brits on the intelligence system and flew in to Basra on uh, the Herc. And as soon as the aircraft landed, we came under indirect fire. It was chaos. I just have vague memories of the loadies grabbing the passengers, which weren't many of us, and escorting or pushing us out of the aircraft and dragging us to whatever cover there was outside. And I remember being dragged across to the refueling tank. So I was taking cover behind the refueling tank that had come out to refuel the plane and just hearing these booms dropping around and I just thought what is going on like this is not ideal lying behind a fuel tanker in the middle of an indirect fire attack so yeah I was pretty stressed and uh, welcome to Basra that was. We also talked about earlier the intensity of the rocket attacks and the accumulation of stress you're feeling throughout this deployment from a range of different factors. Did you start to feel unsafe in the country? Just knowing that any time there could be that could be it, you know, or I could be severely injured. That was always in the back of my mind from the early days, from the first rocket attack maybe. And some people don't feel that at all. Some of us do. So we're all different and that's what makes humans human, I guess. It was a real thing. And one of my good friends, another female intelligence operative, she was not at all affected. She found it quite entertaining getting rocketed and loved it. Well, not loved it, but seemed to like, yeah, bring it on. You mentioned your hair falling out. Were there any other symptoms or difficulties you started experiencing over there? Sleeplessness, anger. I was always pretty jovial, lighthearted sort of person and I'd become a lot more serious and felt I'd changed a lot. Felt I'd changed a lot, yeah. As you get closer to the end of the deployment, is that a light at the end of the tunnel that you can cling to or you're just burned out over it? Get me out of here. Yeah, look, I was burnt out big time and I my replacement had arrived a week earlier and I'd done the handover I'd done and I'd set him up as best I could for success he was keen he was taken over for all intents and purposes and then I got told I was going to be extended a week to conduct a quick investigation on some crypto that had gone missing from one of the battle groups and I literally nearly had a meltdown I just said, I I can't be here any longer. And um, it's all a bit of a blur, that period. I didn't end up staying. Yeah, I don't think I could have managed another minute in that place. (laughs) Tell me then, Sarah, about your journey home, physically and emotionally. We transited through Q8 for the decompression in June of 2007, and I lost a lot of weight. I just didn't eat. I think I just started to breathe again. That's how it felt for me. 
I wasn't in a great headspace at all. I just wanted to go inwards, I think. I actually got back and I think a week later or just after I'd had a bit of leave, I put in my discharge. Yeah. So I just wanted to get out of the army. I don't think I'd, I wanted to be a part of it anymore. I didn't think I was suitable. I didn't feel like I'd done a great job in Iraq, that I'd let the team down in a way. So yeah, I, I remember saying, that's me done. Do you follow through with that discharge request? When I spoke to my careers advisor about it, she convinced me instead to consider leave without pay for a period, which I ended up doing. I applied for two years leave without pay and had plans to go to the UK and finish my master's. So she said, yep, let's do that and then see how you feel. I'd been in the military at that point for 10 years. So maybe a sabbatical at that point was worthwhile. Yeah, benefit of hindsight, I should have got help. (laughs) <laughs> for what I had brought home from Iraq with me, absolutely. And I can 100% say that now that I should have had help for what I was going through because I compartmentalised, I pushed it right down deep in my being and it just never got processed until other things happened in my life where it all had to come flooding out in a big, ugly way. So yes, I think I should have stayed around, gone to see a psychologist, got some help for the feelings I was feeling uh, instead of nipping off to the other side of the world and completely burying it all. But you nip off to the other side of the world, you bury it all as best you can. Then you come back to Australia and you pick up the army life again, and you work in intelligence roles for domestic security with the army, ASIO and AFP. So again, doing some really cool stuff, a lot of interesting information going over those eyeballs of yours. And then you're promoted to major, the intelligence analyst for all Middle Eastern countries except Afghanistan. Tell me about that. Yeah, look, it's funny how life ends up taking you back in a circle, I guess. And um, I was focused on the country where I'd left in a pretty bad way. So I had the knowledge, I had the information in my head stored down and understanding of the culture. So it did help me in that role. However, it wasn't long before I started to realize that having not processed what I'd been through over in Iraq was coming back to bite. I was starting to have nightmares, lose sleep, ruminate again on my time in Iraq. It all just started to come back up in a big way. I enjoyed the role. I enjoyed working in that strategic environment again and seeing how it did make a difference. However, yeah, it was at a cost to my mental health and uh, it was getting closer to the time where I couldn't run and hide anymore. Because it wasn't like it was a non-intense period either. You're in this role around the time of the Arab Spring and you're also pregnant with your first child? Yes, I found out I was pregnant um, in that wonderful year of... (laughs) The um, Middle East crisis of, yeah, Syria falling and and just everything. I remember just being in the office for extended periods of time trying to react to what government was requiring from us from an intelligence point of view and risk assessments for troops in and out of that area. Uh, Yeah, it was a pretty full-on time, especially when morning sickness kicked in. So I managed to get through most of that year and then I have my son in October and uh, start a period of a short period of maternity leave. We were building a house at the time, so I didn't have the luxury of taking too long off. And I was back at work when my baby was four months old, but I'd asked to be posted out of that intelligence environment. So I was posted into army headquarters into a personnel policy role, which allowed me a little bit more flexibility in the role, not quite as an intense work environment. And how does your mental health progress from there? Well, uh, becoming a first-time mum, Alex, I was, (laughs) wow, that was... A bit frazzled? A bit frazzled. There was not much sleep happening, which, as everyone knows, with sleep deprivation comes a whole other level of suffering. And so I was doing the best I could, (laughs) turning up to work on a couple of hours sleep, Worried that I wasn't doing a great job as a mum because I wasn't putting him into care while I went to work when he was less than six months old. And um, yeah, just a whole bunch of questions as to what I was, you know, what was important. Sleep deprived with a newborn. I anticipate nightmares as well off the back of your analyst role. So you're grappling with multiple levels of stress at once. 
keeping my mouth out of just above water and just my legs are sort of kicking as fast as they can just to keep going in the direction I thought I should be heading, which was trying to do it all. <laughs> and again, I think this is a thing that us as women we face we want it all and it is hard when you realise actually you can't do it all at once and sometimes something's going to give and it was my mental health that went. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, the year following I was posted and I started back full time and into a role that the other major had deployed to Afghanistan. So I was for all intents and purposes doing two roles with a 12-month-old by then and commuting two hours a day and my dad got diagnosed with terminal cancer a couple of months later and I completely fell apart. I'd struggled on with it for a few months to try and be strong for my mum who was dealing with her husband, my father, you know, dying before our eyes. And um, I had the stress of the construction of my house still on a bit on my shoulders, needing to have the income. And so for a few months I held it together. I would go into the toilets and cry, have a cry, come back out, put on the brave face, keep working until I just couldn't do it anymore. I think I had a panic attack as I was getting ready to go to work one morning and I was, again, had just found out I was pregnant with my second and at that point I thought I'm going to lose this baby if I don't do something because of the stress. So I went to the GP and I said, this is what's happening for me and um Following on from that, I think that's when it all started to come out that I was very unwell. Let's talk about the methods you've used to overcome that and manage that. Using physical health to aid mental health is a tried and true method. And we've talked about your sporting interest before, Sarah, but today you are quite the athlete. So tell me about the role physical health has played and your devotion to exercise today. I'm lucky that I've always actually really enjoyed fitness. I think this became even more so post-children and then having been discharged from the army, it became my healing, I guess, in that I needed it to feel some goodness about myself. And after the second child, I was very unfit. My body had changed and it was really hard to go back to where I had been previously in my fitness. So, but that in itself was a good challenge for me. So it was something that kept me going to try and achieve those fitness levels I'd known I'd had in the past. But then from there, I don't know if some of my friends might call it obsession. <laughs> I somehow ended up getting into the sport of Ironman and yeah, started off with a couple of triathlons, but then thought, rightio, there's more to this and I, I can see what my body can do. I want to see how far it can go. When I was in France and I didn't have opportunity to work, I got right into training. So I just signed up for my first half Ironman in Barcelona and uh, thought, right, if I can finish this, I'll be like the happiest person in the world because it's huge. It's going to be hard, but I reckon I can manage. Watching you on Instagram is a great inspiration. You're always posting great content just about the insane amount of training you're doing. And I do a decent amount of training, but I feel constantly put to shame when I see what you're up to. Oh, mate. Well, I think if it's something that makes you happy, it's not so much a challenge is it like I guess it's challenging in that asking your body to go to places pushing beyond the limits you've already perceived yourself to have it's a pretty cool thing when you can go past that and see that actually you can keep going and the body can respond if your mind is willing and it's a healthy addiction I'd say so look it's not a cheap sport either but <laughs> if uh you know I'm spending money on race entries as opposed to Jimmy Choo Shoes well whatever like that's me I love the sport I love the people who do the sport yeah there's some weirdos but who's not weird in this world we we all want to get the best out of ourselves and we actually at races you can recognize the camaraderie and the um, respect for the athletes that tow the, the start line of an Ironman like there is no way you can do an Ironman race without preparing putting in the time and the hard yards some parallels there from the better parts of the military as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, I, I hope I haven't sort of sounded all doom and gloom about my military experience because it absolutely has set me up to have the mindset in which I think many of us leave the military with. And is that is that we are way more capable than we think we are. And we have so much more capacity to push beyond boundaries 
because we signed that dotted line to serve our country and we really believe in things that matter to us, we will endeavour to, to chase after and get. Well, we've discussed many of the challenges you face during service, Sarah, but you've just listed there some fantastic positives you take away from that. And I don't want the negative to outshine the positive at all because you've described there how it's changed and grown you for the better. I know the answer to this question. Do you look back and regret joining? No, I don't regret joining. 100% the best mates I've made for life have come from my military service. The skills, the experiences, the travel, exposure to cultures I never would have imagined to be exposed to and just the general I'm going to be proud to tell my boys I served in the military when they are old enough to understand what that means and yeah it's it's a big deal. You're actively giving back a lot to the veterans community today Sarah I know you are an ambassador for Soldier On for example. Yeah look Soldier On came along in my life when I was medically discharged from army and they put me on a path, I guess, towards this fitness addiction (laughs) or fitness passion I have by introducing me to bikes, riding, cycling. So I am super grateful for what Soldier On has done for me in terms of giving me a bit of direction post-military and, you know, the friendships born out of that. And like them and other ESOs, ex-serving organisations who are set up to assist veterans post-discharge or who are struggling with transition, it's crucial that they exist. I think because as Australians, we don't actually come forward readily to ask for help. So having options out there to tap into really is valuable for Australian veterans, I think, to reconnect. And I think connection after service is vital because we lose a family in a way by leaving that environment and being able to reconnect with others that have shared a similar experience to you is absolutely critical, I think, to move forward and keep going in a positive direction in life. We're on your quite tranquil property here, which is beautiful and expansive, not quite as congested as, say, Sydney, where I'm from. I imagine you still feel that strong sense of connection to those you serve with, even if they're not in your day-to-day life. Yeah, look, I don't think there's many days that go by that I don't think of all the people that I've come across in my military service, the role they played in my life and how impactful a lot of them were. So I think, yeah, I may be miles away physically from them now, but they'll always be in my head and my heart. What does the future hold for you, Sarah? Yeah, that's a tricky one. I think I'm still kind of working in the veteran advocacy space by being available and ready to promote the causes for veterans. I hope to have that in my life for a long time. However, I think, you know, as my boys get older and life changes and I'm looking at other options of what I'd like to do in terms of career. So yeah, there's a few things on my mind. I will continue to do Ironmans. I'm currently doing my triathlon coaching certification and staying active in the sporting communities around town. So yeah, I love sport. I love what it does for people and communities. I think it's a fundamental part of being a human to be active. If I can help inspire others to be physically active, that's my one of my main goals and drivers. I'd love to be able to help people chase after physical goals because it absolutely helps mentally to be well, well-rounded person. Well, Sarah, I think you are a role model to many. Thank you for your service, your honesty, for having me in your home and for your time today. Thank you so much, Alex. I really uh, enjoyed having a chat with you today and thanks for your time too. You're doing a great thing. Every Tuesday, we'll release a new interview with a veteran of the Army, Navy, Air Force, or Special Forces. Subscribe in your podcast app, on YouTube, or on our website to never miss an episode. Find out more about this show at www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. You can follow us on social media at Life on the Line Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, and at LOTL Pod on Twitter. If you enjoyed today's conversation with Sarah, Please rate us five stars in Apple Podcasts and recommend the show to your friends. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening, and lest we forget.